kosher and respected Saturday as the Sabbath. The Judeo-Christians differed from traditional Jews only on one belief, that Jesus was the Messiah. His job as Messiah was to liberate Jerusalem from the Romans and bring world peace. I traveled from Jerusalem to where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran, a dry plateau about a mile inland from the shore of the Dead Sea. I met with Professor Robert Eisen who told me that Qumran supported various communities starting some 2100 years ago. But scholars are loath to identify Judeo-Christians with the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the caves here around Qumran. And then what do the scholars do? They come along and tell us, oh, people like Eisenman don't know what they're talking about. Oh, there's nothing there, nothing interesting, nothing to do with Christianity. This is a much earlier group. You can go to sleep, folks, and forget about it. Then we came along and said, no, folks, wake up. This is not just an earlier group. This is a contemporary group. In fact, this is an aboriginal Christian group here. Eisenman says that James, the brother of Jesus, ran things for the Judeo-Christians here at Qumran. His theory is one that many scholars can't swallow. Nonetheless, he says he can uncover an early Christianity that has been hiding in plain sight. How can he do it? It's complex, but it goes something like this. One, re-examine the ancient texts. Two, compare in detail the texts with the Christian Bible. And three, identify an archaeological landmark. By building a detailed comparison of ancient texts with the Christian Bible, Eisenman says he can draw a treasure map and identify a landmark that physically places James at Qumran 2,000 years ago. And that may change the way we look at Christianity. His method starts with a new examination of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're looking across into the most important cave found, Cave 4. That is the library cave. There were literally tens of thousands of fragments found in that cave, just piled up in a huge, unruly manner. The famous Dead Sea Scroll. Absolutely. We live in miraculous times. Out of nowhere comes this beautiful material that tells us all about this movement. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, Eisenman says he's found references to James, the brother of Jesus, also known as James the Just. And we know that every time in the Qumran materials that you see the word just one or righteous one, the interpretation is the righteous teacher. So there is a leader in the Dead Sea Scrolls called the just one or the righteous one. Do you believe the teacher of righteousness is James? Yes. Why do you think that? Because everything in his doctrine, everything that we identify with him, everything that we know about him makes it clear that his thinking is parallel or part of the kind of group we have here. We have one basic messianic movement out here, and this is the center of it. If Eisenman can place James at the center of it all, he can unveil a form of Christianity that has been lost for 2,000 years. It would mean that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain some of the earliest writings of the Jesus movement. And we can see them as they were. Yes. It's all in their literature. They're righteous. They're very imaginative. They're messianic. They don't believe in turning the other cheek. They don't love their enemy. They wish a final apocalyptic judgment on all the people who are destroying Palestine, the Israelites, and all the people around them. But most scholars call the group that lived at Qumran the Essenes, and the group that followed James the Ebionites. These scholars believe that the Essenes wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, not James's Ebionites. But Eisenman tells me to look a little closer at the evidence. He believes that many of the Essenes and the Ebionites were one and the same. And that means they were Judeo-Christians. I don't even know if there's someone else who would say, hey gang, you read about the teacher of righteousness? That's James, the brother of Jesus. That's the Ebionites. You're reading there the original Jesus movement right. before it's been tampered with. Before it's been, yes, overwritten. That's what you believe. Oh, absolutely. Eisenman points out that there is a letter in the Dead Sea Scrolls that scholars call MMT. It's a letter that just may be greased by the fingerprints of James. That makes Eisenman pretty excited. It's a letter, I like to call it a, a letter on works righteousness. Was found here? found in cave four. And what it is, a letter to a foreign king of some kind that needs tuition in the law of uh, Moses. They're telling a king how to 
how to keep the law of Moses. But there are converts in northern Syria who do need tuition. MMT, to my mind, is a Jamesian letter to one of these rulers laying out things that are required of them. Eisenman has compared the MMT letter found at Qumran with a letter attributed to James in Acts 15 of the Christian Bible. And what he's discovered is extraordinary. The letters seem to match. We know that James's followers in Acts took a letter down to Antioch, which banned fornication, blood, strangled things, meaning carrion, and things sacrificed to idols. It reflects Qumran doctrine almost all the way through it. It's totally consistent with everything you find here in Qumran. So if you're right, the letter found there called MMT is actually maybe penned by James. That's the key, that that letter actually contained all the things we know that James's letter contained in the book of Acts. But this is huge. You're telling me that some of the writings that we find here are really the writings of what we would call today, or the world generally, the early church. The early church in Palestine, yeah. not the Pauline one. No, the actual followers of Jesus. Yes. Eisenman is quick to make the distinction between the followers of Jesus and another developing movement that scholars call Pauline Christianity. That's because for the Ebionites, the continuing Jesus movement led by James, the real troubles begin with a man named Paul. Paul was the enemy of his. Paul persecuted early Christians. He didn't even know who he was. What, Paul's telling us he knows Christ better than James, better than Peter, better than people who have spent their whole life with him who followed him, who succeeded him, like the Kennedy brothers, would know more about who their brother was than people who were their enemies, who admit to having persecuted Christians in their lifetime. Eisenman also points out that the writings uncovered here describe a spouter of lies, an enemy of the Dead Sea Scrolls community. I planned all this too carefully to have it all blown off my face now. According to Eisenman, the mysterious spouter of lies is none other than the Apostle Paul. After all, unlike the 12 apostles, Paul never met Jesus. And I didn't even know him. I never saw him before in my life. According to Acts, Paul admits that he was a brutal persecutor of the Ebionite Jesus movement until his miraculous conversion to Christianity. So Paul is the first guy to try to drive a nail into the Ebionites, the James party, the Judeo-Christian. He, he pacifies the Messianic movement. Whether he did it on purpose, whether he has a, An a, axe to grind. a, a super ego. You don't like him. How can you like someone like that? Eisenman's dislike of Paul stems in part from comparing the Christian Bible to an ancient doctor and believes he has identified strong evidence that Qumran was HQ for the early Jesus movement. By comparing the Clementine recognitions to the Christian Bible, he says he can identify a landmark that physically places James, the brother of Jesus, at Qumran. The recognitions were supposedly penned by the third pope, aptly named Clement. Clement describes a scene in which James flees from Jerusalem, seemingly to Qumran. You have Clement going to Jerusalem, witnessing this debate on the temple steps, interrupted by this ferocious man who comes in and leads a riot of uh, blood and beating in which he throws James down the temple steps and leaves him for dead. James is not dead. That night, his followers, and this is recorded, pick him up, take him to a house in um, Jerusalem. The next day, 5,000 of them flee down to Jericho with James. The enemy, he's not named as such, he's just called the hostile, uh, the enemy man. But in any case, he goes and gets letters from the high priests to pursue these early Christians, as they're called, all the way to Damascus. Although the Clementine text does not name the hostile enemy, his actions exactly match those of the Apostle Paul as described in the New Testament. In Acts 9, Paul chases the early Christians down the road to Damascus. But before he can catch them, he has a vision of the resurrected Jesus. It's an experience so powerful that Paul stops his chase and enlists with Christ. The story in Acts exactly matches the tale in the Clementine writings. And so Eisenman says that the unnamed enemy must be Paul. Paul is chasing the James community. Right, after the riot in the temple. Paul pursues James on his way to Damascus, comes through Jericho, but he misses them. Where did they go? Where right did away, they go? On, I'm gonna tell you where they went. 
By matching the recognitions to the Christian Bible, Eisenman has uncovered the story. While James and his followers were on the run from Paul, they made a detour to visit a monumental tomb very close to Jericho. The tomb housed the remains of two brothers, and it had a special characteristic that made it visible for miles around. The pseudo-Clementine recognition say the James community were out of Jericho visiting the tomb or mausoleum of two of the brothers that was considered to miraculously whiten of itself every year. But this is very white. Look at it. Yeah, well, I know. But the point was... Robert Eisenman has uncovered what must have been a magnificent and obvious place of veneration. A massive cemetery oriented towards a promontory of brilliant white earth. This is spectacular. Look at the, these graves are undisturbed for 2,000 years. Grave after grave yes. after grave after grave. Look at this. Now... And uh, it's all leading up, you're saying, to that. Right. This is an absolutely spectacular promontory here. Most people just thought it was a lookout or something, a natural formation of some kind. Nobody realized that there was something there. This is incredible. Now we're getting to the most beautiful mother load of all. Come here, Simcha, and look back at this incredible presentation in front of you of the whole graveyard, all centered on this point here. Look at this. Here we have the remnants of the burial enclosure or mausoleum. There's your view going south. And up to the north here, you have the way to Jericho. There Jericho's about, right there, right? No, no, it's up there about 10 kilometers. And a structure here would have been seen by what? Everybody from miles around, right? Heisman's students excavated this mausoleum and uncovered a male skeleton that he believes may be the remains of one of the two brothers that James and his followers were venerating while on the run from Paul. The archaeology substantiates the Clementine writings and that means a Qumran detour saved James and his JC bunch from certain death and bought them enough time for Paul to find Christ. This is that burial monument sepulcher that we're standing on it, that it's such a magnificent, clearly monumental place, that that's where they were, and that's where they went when Paul missed them, right here. This is mind-boggling. This is a piece of detective work that I think is incredible. That's the best I can do. But this remarkable archaeology points to Qumran as an early Judeo-Christian headquarters and some of the Dead Sea Scrolls as the earliest church writings ever found. But the community here was not to last. James was stoned to death in 62, an execution ordered by the high priest in Jerusalem worried about the growing power of his movement. Eisenman argues that the death of James may have triggered the first Jewish-Roman war that led to the destruction of Qumran in 68. The JC bunch were in trouble. They'd lost their HQ at Qumran, and Jerusalem was besieged by the Romans. To make matters worse, Paul took their guidebook and cut a few rules that would change the religion forever. It was the launch of Christianity. How did Paul do it? It was a game of nerves between the Sea of Galilee and the ancient town of Migdal, Mary Magdalene's hometown, to talk with Professor Charlesworth about the Apostle Paul and his effects on the early Jesus movement. I think most historians, as they read the New Testament, realize there's a tremendous tension somehow between Paul's version of what Jesus is all about and James, his brother. And injected it into Gentile popular culture. And when it came time to assemble the first standard Christian Bible, the Gentiles ignored the Judeo-Christian Gospels. Not many people today and even not many scholars know that the Jewish Christians, the Judeo-Christians, had Gospels. The Gospel of the Ebionites, the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Gospel of the Nazareans, and other Gospels. These are what we call Jewish Christian Gospels. These are lost. Why are they lost? Perhaps the powerful community that became the church did not want them. They didn't put them in the New Testament, and probably they destroyed them. As the Pauline followers of Christianity were establishing the church, they were writing the Judeo-Christians out of their Bible. They emphasized the supernatural divinity of Jesus and did not accept the Judeo-Christian belief that Jesus was a mortal man, a Messiah, but not a God. And there were pressures coming from the Jewish side as well. Even though the Judeo-Christians honored the complete Torah, 
including the 613 rules Paul had chucked out.